Uh, good evening and welcome to the May 14th, 2019 City Council meeting. And we'll uh, start with the roll call. Holly? Bartlett? Here. Forsma? Here. Caravello? Here. Doom? Here. Hiley? Here. Hirsch? Here. Jensen? Here. Lagaki? Here. Majeski? Here. Uh, Reeves? Here. Schumacher? Here. And Riley is absent and excused. All right, thank you. Uh, we have communications and presentations. Just a couple quick communications. Uh, Attorney Dragney wasn't available tonight, so uh, Laura Callen is taking his place this evening. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. And then I uh, wanted to let uh, the community know that we're going to have an open house at the new City Hall and the new Public Works Garage on June 13th from 5 to 7 o'clock. June 13th from 5 to 7 at both buildings, so you can tour them both on the same night if you're interested. We'd be glad to have you. Council members, I guess you're welcome as well. Uh, most of you have already been through there. I guess we'll maybe we'll have to post it, uh, make sure that um, we'll get it out in the paper and, and get some advertising going. So spread the word. It should be a fun night, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, people come visit our buildings. We're really proud of them both. I know staff has done a great job getting them prepared, and we appreciate that, and they're working well for us. Are there any communications from council members? President Majewski. Okay, got a couple of things. First, um, a number of us have gotten calls uh, regarding some issues that, that our constituents had uh, that are related to police matters. In such cases, I would suggest that members of council uh, defer to the police department and that, so that they may investigate the uh, complaints. As part of that, sometimes those calls are become getting heated. And when they do, I just wanted to remind you that you are not verbal punching bags. If they cannot calm down, you just have to tell them that until they can calm down, you can't help them and that you're going to be hanging up and walk away from it because it's not going to do the constituent any good and it's not going to do you any good. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing, <clears throat> I'd like to form an ad hoc committee. I'd like to get at least a uh, council member from each district. And it is in regards to uh, a few months back, we had a offer on a open piece of land that we own on 138. Uh, we turned that down because of what was being proposed <coughs> for that site. Since then, we have not come to any conclusions or, and or consensus on what should be there. And we need to start moving in that direction so that we can do something with that site. So if anybody would be interested in uh, doing that, being on that committee, please let me know. Next, um, I'd also like to entertain the thought of an ad hoc committee for an architectural review board for commercial developments. If anybody would like to be on that board, also please let me know. Next and last, I would also like for council members to send me what their goals are for this council for this year, what they want to see achieved. And so we can start putting together some sort of plan, get a priority going of what we'd like to do. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council members have communications? Tom, do you have a timeline on when you want to see? Uh, within the next, before the next council meeting. Okay, thanks. Alderperson person, Hirsch. Uh, Tom, what, for these ad hoc committee, how often do you expect them to meet? That's going to be something that we'll, we will decide once we get the member who wants to be on it, and once we form it, we have our first meeting, we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, thank you. Any other communications from council members? Um, I have a few more. There's in your packet. There's a number of proclamations. Uh, last night we had to kick off dinner for Sentinel so I read the proclamation there for Sentinel and I'll also be reading it again uh, Friday evening. Um, there's I want to highlight a few others. It is National Police Week, Municipal.
Clerk Week, Public, per Public Works Week, and Skilled Nursing Care Week. So uh, we'd like to thank all those groups for the work that they do in our community on our behalf. So those um, proclamations are in the packet. And we are going to move the TIF 101 presentation uh, toward the end of the meeting so we can conduct our business. There's a lot of folks here that would like to get in and out of here, so we want to respect their time. That's all I have. Did anybody else have anything for the last time? Otherwise, we'll get into the agenda. And the next item on the agenda would be the public comment period. And we do have several people signed up for public comment. We just ask that you come up and state your name and address. Uh, we'd like you to keep your comments to three minutes or less. Holly has brought her flashcards in her timer to remind you of your time as it's running down. And uh, the first person to sign up is uh, Matt Griffey. <clears throat> Thanks for having me today, friends. I want to talk to you guys about October, especially since October is Anti-Bully Awareness Month. I'd really like to be able to get the businesses together and work together as a whole so we can really tackle this coming up. I have been working with uh, the police uh, the police, and also the recreational department. We had a, uh, a conversation going back and forth, uh, going uh, talking about setting up some seminars where those individuals will get a chance to uh, practice and understand and role play a little bit more. I would also, uh, at our school at Kicks Unlimited, we are planning to do a uh, seminar there just for our members, but we would be open to doing one for the public as well. Uh, that is something that I would really like to focus in, especially since, you know, one in ten students drop out of school because of repeated bullying. So many different uh, options. One out of three are always getting bullied. One out of four are getting uh, not only uh, cyberbullying, so many different options there. And I'd really like to be, bring awareness and get the businesses in Stoughton and the city as well. Uh, any other, anyone else interested in helping out as well, that'd be super awesome. I'd be appreciated of that help. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And if, if anyone has any questions or comments on that, I would really like to be, you can reach me at uh, info at kicksst.com. And we'll go forward from there. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, next, we have uh, Dale Besky. Just here for questions. Okay, here for questions. All right, we'll keep going. Uh, Peggy Vergen. Good evening, everyone. My name is Peggy Vergen, 225 North Monroe Street. Um, I'm here to summarize why you are seeing three local landmark nominations on your agenda. But I also want to start with mentioning that May is Historic Preservation and Archaeology Month. So I have to get that one in because I didn't get it into your, <laughs> into your packet. Um, so <clears throat> to summarize what's happening, uh, this is regarding R69 2019, R70 2019, and R71 2019. Uh, during review of landmark commission records, a record couldn't be located that showed city council had approved three local landmark nominations for 154 East Main Street, 118 North Page Street, and 515 East Main Street. The local landmark nominations were found, as were the minutes from the landmarks commission meetings, but the final step, council approval, was missing from the record. The city advised the landmarks commission that to correct the record, we should hold a new public hearing so we could formally make a recommendation to council. These buildings have been understood to be local landmarks by the city and property owners since they were approved at prior landmarks commission meetings and the nominations were supported by owners. Nothing has changed regarding the eligibility of these buildings and the original nominations have not been changed. A new public hearing was held April 11th, 2019, and all three were once again approved and are now forwarded to you with a recommendation to approve the local landmark designations. Um, do you want to hear a little bit about the three buildings? Sure, I would. I would. Yeah. Yes? Okay. I'll make it quick. Uh, the Peterson Building, 154 East Main Street, was nominated as a local landmark and a public hearing was held November 15th in 2006 which was 13 years ago. 
At that time, a motion to approve the nomination based on meeting three criteria was passed. The Peterson Building is an Italianate-style commercial building on Main Street, constructed in 1865 of cream brick with wood decorative elements. The building is an excellent example of the style, having character-defining features including tall one-over-one light double-hung sash, projecting and arched window hoods, exhibiting foliate ornament and cornice embellished by bands of dentals. The building has an intact storefront reflecting typical design, including large display windows, large transom windows to emit light into the first floor, and a center door. The nomination goes on to describe the building as unique and irreplaceable as one of the oldest commercial buildings on Main Street. Built the year the Civil War ended, the building embodies the commercial and architectural history of Stoughton. The era and Harriet Gerard House at 118 North Page Street was nominated as a local landmark and a public hearing was held September 7, 2010. A motion to approve the nomination was based on three landmark criteria and was passed at that time. The Gerard House is an excellent example of the Queen Anne style, built in 1886 of wood frame construction with wood clapboard siding and decorative wood shingles. The house has many character defining features including an irregular plan and massing, variety of surface textures, roofs and wall projections, shingle and clapboard siding, steeply pitched roof, dominant front facing gable, cutaway bays, wood double hung windows and the distinctive full width wraparound porch. And finally, the Turner, Dearborn, and Atkinson Tobacco Company Warehouse at 515 East Main Street was nominated as a local landmark, and a public hearing was held June 17, 1993. That was 26 years ago. Mm. A motion to approve the nomination based on three landmark criteria was passed at that time. The Tobacco Warehouse is an imposing cream brick building reflecting elements of the Italianate style. Constructed in 1885, this is an excellent example of industrial vernacular architecture and embodies the design characteristics of a tobacco warehouse. Its large scale, load bearing walls, three stories, double hung windows and cargo doors and spacious interiors for safely storing valuable tobacco crops. Tobacco buyers built large centralized facilities to store crops until they could be shipped, primarily to cigar manufacturers. Located in town in the middle of a heavily tobacco growing region and close to the train depot, providing convenient access to transportation, this depot represents the broad patterns of history and specifically Stoughton's agricultural history and the history of commerce, both for wholesale goods and services. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Sharon Mason Borsma. Thank you very much. My name is Sharon Mason Borsma. I live at 243 East McKinley Street, Stoughton, Wisconsin. Tonight, I'd like to address two events that are happening, and I gave out um, flyers to all of you regarding these two events. The first event is a Narcan training event that will take place on May 22nd at the EMT building, um, or EMS building, rather, and it is going to be from 6.30 to 7.30. And we are going to do some free training sponsored by Stoughton Cares, which is a drug and alcohol prevention coalition for Stoughton. And the statistics are pretty not good. Um, between 2012, 2016, there were 160 deaths in Wisconsin on heroin, 224 deaths um, on prescription opioids. And I noticed uh, when I was looking at these statistics, that the increase has really been quite rampant for 85 year old males and this was in February of 2019 and it spiked up dramatically. So what is the answer? One of the things I think is key is education and we're going to have this open to the public and again it's free for anybody that wants um, Narcan training um, over the age of 18 years old. And we will have free pizza and beverage from 6 to 6.25 p.m. in case you do not have supper. And the presenter is Heidi Olson Street. I met her and I went through the Narcan training in Deerfield about a month ago. Very, very experienced and it was in conjunction with the Dane County Sheriff's Department at that time. 
She will train us on how to identify and respond to an opioid overdose, how to administer Narcan and follow-up care, and the factors in a fatal overdose that could happen and much more. Pre-registration would be appreciated by Monday, May 20th, because you will receive anybody in this training, uh, if you request this, uh, a, a free Narcan kit. And again, she will present on how to use that. If you just want to come, you don't have to register, just come, but you probably you will not get a, a free Narcan kit. So are there any questions? Okay. The second event, well, I just want to mention, this is not just characteristic of Stoughton. Tomorrow night, Deerfield Cares is doing a Cambridge Oxy Today Heroin Tomorrow Denial is Fatal at the Cambridge Elementary School, and that is also free, open to the public. It's a huge town hall meeting on heroin and information on it. So again, it's happening all over. So the second thing I want to address is much more fun. And this is the Stoughton Area Resource Team, and I'd also like to have Barb Rowe come up too. And we're both on the planning team for the Stoughton Area Resource Team. And Barb and I have been planning this event. We take about a year to plan it. It is on May 30th. It is from 5 to 9 p.m. And this year is going to be a huge gala. And we hope to have 300 people come. It is at the Field Reserve, which is over here on Highway N, up on a hill. It's a wedding venue. And it is the best. It is elegant. A Stoughton Opera House is good. This is also good. And we're having a 17-piece live jazz band come, and it's going to rock Highway N off the planet. So there will be an elegant dinner. There will be um, the jazz band, and they perform um, for the Wisconsin Badgers and at the Governor's Mansion. And so we're going to dance, and also there will be auction and raffle prizes. It's $55 a person if you want to have a table. Um, all of that information is on the back. Our guest speaker is Kay Whedon, a local resident, once on city council, and she is a storyteller. We're also going to honor volunteers as well as people that have given their all to the Stoughton community and received services also from START. Is everybody familiar with what the Stoughton Area Resource Team does? Okay, all right. They also, and I didn't know this until Cindy Thompson told me last week, that the homeless population, the students, um, and they're tracked by the Department of Public Instruction. And I don't know what the current rate is. I think it's 40 to 50 students right now that are considered homeless start work with every one of their families. So anyhow, it's a prevention service. Barb, do you want to add anything? No, no thank you. OK. So make your reservations. I asked Cindy, I said, how long can we sign up for this? And she said, the day before. So the day before, May 29th. But if you can get it in earlier, that'd be great. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, we have uh, Roger Springman. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I have to begin with an apology. I had wanted to get to the mayor last week and say I'd like to have a little, carve out a bit more time for my talk tonight, but I forgot to do it, so I'm doing it in public comments. But I thought you'd like a 30,000 look, look, at, look at the progress the RDA has made on the Riverfront project. I thought that would be very interesting to you, so I'm going to do it very quickly. And by the way, just up front, uh, if you hear things you want to hear more of, I'll come back. But I just forgot to do it on the official agenda for tonight. So, as you all know, we began the RFEI process last uh, fall, and we carried it into the spring, February, actually. Uh, we kicked, that's a request for expressions of interest. We wanted to find developers who wanted to uh, come with us to work on the Riverfront project. And a quick uh, thumbnail of our success is this. We had six responses to our RFEI. So six doesn't sound like many, but in fact, that's very good because we, we ended up some very good competent developers who want to be in Stoughton, both as a master developer and as a more specific developer for housing. But as the RDA met over the last uh, month and into last week, uh, last Wednesday, we decided we really wanted to concentrate our efforts on getting a master developer. When you look at the amount of work that we're going to be doing down here, the size of the area, and the impact on Stoughton, which will be forever as far as we're concerned, we really want someone to be there on our team from word go who can run the whole project correctly from the start. And so that's why we, co we concentrated on a master developer as opposed to worrying about uh, the other great developers who simply wanted to develop, let's say, higher density housing 
and maybe a little bit other stuff on the site. So with that said, again, this is my 30,000 foot look, so I'm going to go fast here. So we had our RDA meeting last week. As I said, uh, Gary Becker and I uh, uh, talked to each of the uh, respondents uh, over the phone for up to 20 minutes to half hour to clearly understand what they wanted. So out of the six developers, three said they wanted to be the master developer. So we have three uh, vendors, if you will, who really want to be on our team from word go, who want to make this site work for us. By name, they are Brink Development. Brink is out of Madison. Uh, those of you who, how, who have been to the Brink Lounge, if you know, or High Noon, uh, if you know that area at all, uh, that's the Brink Lounge is named after him because why? He has been a major Madison developer pretty much on the east side of Madison. He recently acquired uh, four acres of property at the old Mott's paint factory area, and he's really working big time on East Washington near the Breeze uh, Stadium area. So if you see all those big buildings over there and all the other stuff that's happening, those are a lot of his buildings. Uh, the other developer is uh, General Capital. General Capital is out of Fox Point, which is, uh, I believe, north side of Milwaukee. And they also have an office in Chicago. Uh, they've been very, very active in southern Wisconsin and actually southern Michigan, as it turns <coughs> out. And so they've got, if you went to their website, you'll see a lot of projects. Uh, they've been very active. They actually have been backup uh, financial supporters of uh, Gorman and a couple other companies on occasion. So they're really blended into the de development community of southern Wisconsin. And the last one is Bear Development out of Kenosha. And Bear Development also uh, has a partnership with Engberg Anderson. That name may sound familiar because why? Because uh, two years ago, Engberg Anderson was the architect for the uh, charrette we had here. Um, I'm guessing many of you were at the charrette. So Engberg Anderson and Mark Ernst of that company did a lot of the architectural work for that project uh, that some actually coming up on two years ago now. So, and they're out of Kenosha. Their projects are mainly southern Wisconsin in northern Illinois. And, most, and all these companies have very great track records, so we should be proud of the fact we have three good vendors who want to be on Team <coughs> Stoughton for the next decade or more or whatever it takes to get the work done. So real quick, what's next? I'm going to cover this real quickly. So we have, this is our short list. We have three good vendors, and we, at our last meeting, we all felt very good about them. We all felt like they're going to get the job done for us. So what do we do with these developers? So on June 26th, we're going to be having a three and a half hour long, or thereabouts, RDA special meeting to meet each team in more specific. Because recall, the idea of the RFEI was to build a relationship with the development team we want to, want to work with. We can't do that until we meet them. So we're going to spend an hour together for each team and then meet afterwards, after the meeting is over, to make sure we got the teams we want to go forward to submit a proposal. So the proposal process will effectively begin then in July, and it will run probably 60 days or thereabouts. We haven't quite set that time break yet or time limit, and that will carry us into the early fall. Uh, the other thing we're going to do probably in late July, early August, is have a proposers meeting where each development team will come back to Stoughton, and this will be a larger public meeting where the public and, the, and anyone else who wants to meet with them can meet with them ask questions, and we reason, the reason why we don't want to do that too early is that they are still developing, they only know what they've seen on our website. They haven't visited it with us in more detail. So our meeting on June 26th then is to give them time to meet us, to know us, we them, and we can walk together down the road side by side. So that's the idea here. So the more larger scale public meeting will be held likely uh, late July, early August. So I think that covers the basics real quick. I, like I said, it's 30,000 feet. The last thing I want to call to your attention is something that's been on our minds for a while, and I'm just alerting you to, to this because we, we, we are pretty convinced that once the developers come here, they're going to want to know about the powerhouse. The reason is, is this, because that's one of the projects that's right there, ready to go. The building is up. It's at a great location. We have the possibility of the Whitewater Park next to it. So they're all really kind of queued up on that building in part. But w there's been some uh, kind of back and forth on where we go with the size of the, lo of the lot area, uh, the footprint of the landmark area itself. So what I just call your attention to is the fact that it would be great if we could get this issue resolved uh, before the developers start spending more time here in July. Because if we think once they're here, they're going to they're want to start to build that into their RFP. 
and, and the RFP then will be likely one of the first things that really lets us know what they want to do specifically with every parcel that we have out there. So we're really hoping we can get to a solution on the uh, powerhouse sometime in later June or perhaps into July at the latest. So with that, I, I hope I did it. I hope you're interested, satisfied, and you think we've done our jobs. It's been a very busy time. We've had a lot of special meetings, and I'm really proud of this RDA. We really have worked our tail off. We like working our tail off, don't get me wrong, but uh, and there's still some left, although it doesn't feel like it some days. But uh, we, we've, we have more to do, and we're going to get it done, and we're going to make Stoughton proud and put us back in the map. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, and that ends our public comment period for tonight. Um, it takes us right to the consent agenda. I um, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Moved by Jensen. Is there a second? Second. Second by Bartlett. Would anybody like anything removed from this consent agenda? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. None opposed. That carries. There is no old business. New business, public hearing to consider special assessments for the improvement of curb and gutter, retaining walls, sidewalks, driveway aprons, carriage walks, drains, improvements, stormwater connections, hand railing, sanitary sewer, and water main extensions for the 2019 street reconstruction project. And um, Planning Director Scheel, is there anything you'd like to go through to kind of cue this up for us before we open up the public hearing? Sure. Just, just to... Um, <coughs> give a little background this is for the major reconstruction projects and construction projects we have going on this year Patterson streets being fully reconstructed Monroe Street from Patterson to Lowell all of Lowell Street is being reconstructed uh, we're pulverizing Lincoln Avenue from Van Buren Street to Kingsland Road um, we're also doing a pulverization project on Jackson Street oh I'm sorry that was Jackson Street from Van Buren to Kingsland Lincoln Avenue from Jackson North to Roby um, and then we have miscellaneous sidewalk replacement um, that met the criteria for replacement. The special assessment schedule was sent out and shared with property owners for each affected property based on the ordinances we have on the books. Um, we did hold an open house on the construction project in January. So we've been fielding questions and dealing with uh, concerns and comments along the way. And I think we've reconciled a, a great number of them already. So if there's questions, we'll certainly try to answer them. Okay, any questions before we close our regular meeting and reopen for the public hearing? Seeing none, we'll close our regular meeting and then reopen for public hearing. Is there anyone here that would wish to speak uh, to the special assessment resolution that's here? Come on up. Please uh, just state your name and address for the record and let us know what you think. Hi, my name is Jim Bluen. I live at 600 West Main Street. So I'm kind of getting it from both ends, Highway 51 and Monroe Street. And there's a special assessment of $1,700 um, to replace sidewalk. Sidewalk that people that use it, I talk to a lot of people that live in on a corner like that, and they see nothing wrong with the sidewalk. Uh, there are two cracks in the gutters. It's fine. You're going to replace the street. That's, I can understand that. But I don't see why you need to replace a sidewalk that's in perfectly good condition. Um, that's all. As far as the assessment goes, we don't need no special financing or anything else. It just seems to be a little excess. Uh, Ten years ago, that same property, I wasn't here at that time, but that same property was also assessed $3,800 for reassessment. So that's like a double hit for a single taxpayer. And uh, we're already paying $4,800 a year in taxes anyway. So I'd appreciate your consideration if you can put the sidewalk into the street project or work it out somewhere so I don't get assessed so high. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak at the public hearing? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and then reopen for our regular business. So we have um, R65 of 2019, uh, which comes from our finance committee. Alderperson person Schumacher. Uh, R65 2019 resolution authorizing improvements and levying special assessments against benefited property in the city of Stoughton for the improvements, improvement of curb and gutter, retaining walls, sidewalks, driveway aprons, carriage walks, 
drainage improvements, storm sewer connections, hand railing, sanitary sewer and water main extensions for the 2019 street reconstruction project. Move. Uh, yeah. Second. I should have started with that. Move. Right. No. There's a motion. And who is the second? By Alder Person Hirsch. And is there anything else you'd like to add to that, or that pretty much sums it up? That pretty much sums it up. And okay. anything that, that Rodney added to that. Okay. Alder Person Hirsch. I just have a question. I know last year when the assessments came <clears throat> in, there were some um, people that had retaining walls and others that were quite expensive. Are we anticipating any big expenses this year? Last year, I think somebody was assessed like 17000 which was ridiculous. So is there anything that our constituents are facing that much? Uh, I'm not aware of any that are that much. And there, I don't believe there's any re retaining wall activity in this year's projects. OK, great. Thank you. Alder person Borsma. Okay, uh, yes, uh, and this is directed for Rodney, if that's okay. Um, and that is, um, uh, Jim just talked about um, the fact that he's got a good sidewalk and uh, doesn't he doesn't believe it needs to be re replaced. Is there, what is the process? Uh, um, can people appeal that or can, can people look at that sidewalk or other sidewalks that might be in great shape and don't need replacement or is that something that's just sort of automatic from a developer from a public contractor or whatever I can certainly respond um, we have written criteria for replacement of sidewalks that's what we utilize to establish the list we'll certainly revisit the site um, and make sure the criteria are met um, there's tripping hazards there's standing and ponding water and improper drainage in some locations as you can ref, uh, you know, understand, we're trying to bring things into compliance when we're doing this project. Unfortunately, this property spoke of having some assessment work uh, for work that might have been done 10 years ago. I can't speak to what scope that was or if that was different sidewalk sections, but we'll certainly revisit the site and take a look. So, so the, the, the correct process would be to have the, um, the constituent, uh, the citizen, approach your office and, and ask you to take a look yeah, I, I've taken note of it. I've been working with individual constituents throughout the last six weeks um, with situations that they've raised questions, and I've tried to reconcile those issues with them. I'll do the same here. I was unaware of the question on this property at this point. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderperson Hirsch. Um, this probably goes to Chamin. He might know. Um, we brought this up in utilities, and um, with respect to uh, the now that we're kind of disrupting the streets and then the lateral is going to the house with respect to lead, is how many houses in this proposed area do you know? I know I'm kind of throwing it at you at, you know, tonight, but that do potentially have a lead problem and how many people actually have signed up to replace those laterals into their house that contain lead at this point? Yeah, off the top of my head, I apologize, but I don't know the number of laterals, um, lead laterals. Um, as far as I know, nobody's approached. Um, but again, I, I wouldn't be privy to that information because the customer would have to pay for that side of it anyway. And they'd, they'd contract, contract out on their own as well. Okay. I could just elaborate a slight. Uh, uh, the utilities, I think, sent communications out to the property owner specific about um, considering the lead replacement if necessary. Um, I know that my office has actually received two calls for interested parties considering that. Okay. Um, we're redirecting them to the utilities to coordinate that, but I don't have a total number that might be interested in doing that on their own. Okay. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a concern of mine that we have these streets ripped up prime time to replace a chronic problem. And yeah. I mean, I know people probably don't consider it as a problem or they may not afford it it's just a the, concern. the utilities are doing the work in the street that's correct right so they're doing it's up going to the curb. from <coughs> the street to their house is right. not part of it yep. and this is a time that they should be replacing that if they're going to save money yeah and i just want to not hound you guys i just want it to be 
everybody here that is new that this is something that we should really be trying to find a solution for. And so I just, I know utilities were trying to figure something out and just want all the newcomers here to realize that it's a concern and we have a lot of lead pipes still in Stilton that is not necessarily good for anybody's health to have. So thank you. Sorry to put you guys on the spot. So, but. And, and I would add there was a number of people that came to the to the open house that evening. So all the information was there and they could actually look at maps and see their individual lot to see if whether or not um, lead pipe was going to their home. Um, I know there was a proposal in the governor's budget to to put some money in there to try to help address this issue, not only for Stoughton, for all the communities in Wisconsin. Unfortunately, the Joint Finance uh, Committee has already removed that from the governor's budget. So that would be one of the items that when I go to the Capitol next week that I'll lobby um, our representatives to you know, try to get that put back in, if not this year and future years, because it's definitely a concern. And you're right, it is much more cost effective to do it when the road is tore up um, to get that work done. But it's up to the individual homeowner to, to make those arrangements. If I may, sure. um, it, there there's some some requirements too on the pipeline from the Public Service Commission that this is going to happen um, in terms of near future. I'd say probably within the next few years, we're we're going to need a, a set program in place that the customers are required to replace their side as well too. Um, in terms of funding for that, that's we're, we're not sure what the actual possibilities are on that side of things. But I will note costs are not going to go down so I'd rather do it now than later um, but it, but it is down the pipeline that this will be required at some point mayor does the, does the utility have a map of all the locations that, that would be leaded yep they had a map and they really went the length of the table they were provided by our engineer who's here today and you could see the individual lots so uh, the information was available and like I said there was a good turnout that night I was really Happy to see that. It's nice to see the community engaged in the process. Alder Person Borsma. I would I would be interested in having an expert come to one of our meetings, City Council, and talk about the, um, you know, the risk involved for the city and for the constituents of the city. If we could arrange for that at some point, I think that all of us um, could benefit from that kind of education. Um, I know that, uh, you know, I, there has been some controversy about whether or not it's it's as bad a problem as it as, as it could, you know. Well, some people say it is, um, but uh, but I, I think I think it would behoove us to have somebody to really um, explain it to us in more detail. Okay, um, I'll note that. And we'll see what we can do. Aside from me talking about water <laughs> endlessly. Yeah. Any other questions on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, resolution 66 of 2019 is coming from the Planning Commission. Um, who would like to introduce that? Would you be able to do that, Phil? I can tackle that. All right. Uh, resolution R66-2019 is approving an extraterritorial jurisdictional land division uh, request by Dale Besky for property located at 1345 Tower Drive, town of Dunkirk, Dane County, Wisconsin, and I so move. Second. Second by all the person, Riley. Anything to add to that, Phil, or? <laughs> it was pretty straightforward uh, certified survey map everything seemed pretty easy really okay nothing I think director shield anything you'd like to add otherwise Dale's here if we have any questions for him just to highlight it's on the um, outer edges of our extraterritorial jurisdictional boundary which is within a mile and a half of our city limits um, this lot is being expanded to accommodate a, a septic area or drain field um, being added to the parcel. So it's certainly a logical connection. It's, it's not contrary to city plans to do so. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. 
Um, R67 of 2019 also comes from the Planning Commission. Alderperson Caravello. Uh, R67 2019 approving a certified survey map at 409 Lowell Street, which is owned by Paul Rockwell, Dane County, Wisconsin. So moved. Second. And a second by Alderperson Schumacher. Anything on this one? Just seemed like a logical uh, split of this property to make it work for the property owner and it seemed like it was, like I said, just a logical split that'll mm -hmm. work with that neighborhood. Okay, anything like, you'd like to add? Uh, just to highlight, this is between Lowell Street and Milwaukee Street as shown in the plan. Um, currently the lot extends between both streets so it's got double frontage. This will actually create another buildable parcel off of the Milwaukee Street frontage. Um, so it's really ripe for infill development. Other person, Hirsch? Um, Rodney, just curious, uh, the two properties on either side, are they also split or are they long? Uh, I think they're already split. Um, I think both of these on either side have already been split. Okay. And, and they might already have homes on the Milwaukee side as well. Okay. Right, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Thank you. R68 of 2019. This one, I think it went through parks and ended up at Finance Committee. Alderperson Schumacher. Uh, R68 2019, authorizing and directing the proper city official officials to enter an agreement with GRG Playscapes for the design and installation of a natural adventure playground at Criddle Park. So moved. Second. And there's a motion and a second by Jensen. Anything you'd like to add to this one, Brett? Not really. They, I mean, they came, it was, again, pretty simple and on budget. And, and then uh, uh, Park Director uh, Glenn is here if you have any questions for Dan. All the person, Hirsch? Well, just to introduce Dan, and this is Criddle Park, which is um, right off of, what is it, Monroe Street? Neighborhood Park. Or, I can't it's remember. Monroe. Monroe. Oh. And uh, it was a natural escape park to begin with. It's just a small pocket park. And Dan worked really hard to work with the community to figure out what the kids in the neighborhood and the parents want because the uh, park has, was needed some major repairs. and. From what he found is that they want the natural kind of playscape again, which is, and we had, what, three proposals, and only one actually came back with the natural wood. The rest came back with the plastic composite. And so there was only really one option. Yeah, exactly. The The biggest feedback I got from the neighbors of the park where they wanted the, they liked the, how the structure was, the current one there. Um, because it really fostered imaginative play. And I think the feedback I got from the different kids throughout the community events and the barbecue for, that I hosted for the neighbors, um, this proposal really hits the nail on the head as far as the design goes and what they wanted. So I, um, I've had people, and actually neighbors of the park who are community gardeners or they're, you know, they do other things with us as, as the rec department. and. They saw this on my desk, and the guy goes, oh, is that the one for Criddle Park? And then they're really excited about it. So I, I think they'll be pr really pleased with how this playground will be. Okay. And did I hear you're going to repurpose part of it? Um, yeah, so like the main the main uh, posts that go into the ground. So the I, I met with the contractor along with the uh, Parks Maintenance Supervisor over the fall, and um, he, he looked at the structure and saw if he can reuse some of the wood, the wood and he, th he thought like the main posts were uh, were still in really good shape. He didn't see any rot. He dug down into the underneath the wood fiber chips, so he he incorporated that into his design. So there'll be all new decking. Um, there'll be also some other areas where it's black locust wood. You can see where like the beams are sort of create like a t like a TP shape where there's a climbing structure. Those are made out of black locust wood. Um, so yeah, but some of the structure will, the main posts will stay as they are now. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Well, person Hailey. I uh, just want to underline that uh, everyone uh, at the Parks Committee thought that this was by far the best choice and 
that the other choices were um, deficient in terms of what we were asking for. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. Thanks, Dan. Um, R69 and 2019. Um, this one, actually, the next three are coming from Landmarks, and we have a new Landmarks representative, and that would be Alderperson Lagaki. Yes, this is a resolution that at a meeting I did not attend on April 11th, but this is um, the official designation of the building historically known as the Turner and Atkinson Tobacco Warehouse at 515 East Main, also 100 South 7th Street as a local landmark in the city of Stoughton. I so move this past the Landmarks Commission meeting 4 to 0. Second by President Majewski. Anything anybody would like to add to this one? Uh, all the person Jensen and then Hiley. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I, if I understood what Peggy was saying correctly, I believe that all of the landowners on all three of these are aware of the issue that, that, that they were you know, designated landmarks and then there was a delay and never got to council. So they're, they're aware of this and they're uh, all right with going ahead with this again, right? That is my understanding as well. I think that we are getting the official designations in books caught up with something that's been known. Just want to make sure they know what they're getting into. <laughs> okay. And all the person highly? Yeah. Uh, just curious what exactly it means to designate a local landmark in this case, or in these cases. Benny, would you like to answer that? that, or would you like some help? Um, I'm happy to speak initially and please add, um, but there's um, an ordinance that where significantly historic buildings, whether it's the architecture, whether it's events that took place there, whatever be, um, there is criteria in the ordinance off the top of my head. I don't know that number, but um, when these beautiful buildings in our city have that criteria and the people who currently own those want to enter into relationship um, to be known as a local landmark, then there's all kinds of standards that apply. Okay. And President Maskey, would you like to add to that? Yes. Uh, a local landmark is, it, it can also be of national significance, but it is more so um, celebrating the its local significance. As part of that, it, when it becomes a local landmark, they are then required, the, the biggest thing is, is that the exteriors, when any changes done to them, must be approved by the Landmarks Commission so that that building will be preserved in its original format. Okay. And it would be as outlined in Chapter 38 is the ordinance for landmarks. So there's a lot of reading there, but there's some, all the standards are in there and all the terms that Peggy were using are in there and then if you're really interested we do have a book that was put together several years ago that really kind of walks you through all the design standards in historical preservation that we use and it's really a, a user-friendly book it's kind of thick but it's really a, a great piece of information and we can certainly get you a copy if you'd like to look at that for anyone on the council all the person Borsma yeah I would just add that uh, a, a local landmark cannot be demolished without permission from you would have to go through landmarks and landmarks and planning yeah. and there would be it would have to be pretty extreme circumstances as outlined in the ordinance which we updated in the last couple years so it's pretty clear and unless it was really a catastrophe it would be very difficult to to get approval to, to demolish a, a local landmark and there's also some historical tax credit eligibility that you might be able to get from the state and from the federal if it's on the national registry so those are added benefits for the property owner if they want to do the improvements and then the landmarks also has we have the council in previous years has budgeted uh, for the landmarks to do a grant for property owners that want to do some work to help them offset some of the costs associated with upgrading their buildings so there are some financial benefits as well well the person and then, yeah, I was just going to add one final thing and that is that there can be an emblem put on the building that this is a local landmark and 
Um, that's it's, it's really a nice plaque then on, on a number of our buildings in the city. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else on this one? Otherwise, here none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, R70 of 2019 also comes from the Landmark Commission. This is a resolution officially designating the house, historically known as the Era H and Harriet Grout Gerard House at 118 North Page Street as a local landmark in the city of Stoughton, Wisconsin. Approved by the Landmarks Commission 4 to 0. I so move. Second by President Majewski. Any more explanation on this one? Beautiful house. I have a question, if I could. Sure, all the person. And that is, uh, is it is it currently it's currently occupied, correct? And and the um, do, do the uh, owners uh, are they in agreement with the fact that it become a local amendment? As Greg had asked before, yes, they are in agreement, and Peggy had clarified that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on this one? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. And R71 of 2019. Looks like landmarks were busy. They officially got it all cut up. Um, this is a resolution officially designated the building at 148 to 154 East Main Street, historically known as the Hans Peterson Building as a local landmark in the city of Stoughton this approved by the Landmarks Commission for nothing. Sounds like a baseball score. I so move. <laughs> and a second by President Majewski. Any more explanation on this one? All the person bores me. This is another question and that is the owners of this building, are they in agreement with the fact that this becomes a local landmark? As Peggy stated, I believe they are in agreement and they probably thought they were in agreement even before, but I, on this one, on this business, do not know that personally. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Okay, the next three are first readings from public safety. And I've lost, are you still the chair officially? Yes, I am. Okay, well, we'll turn it over to you, Alder Person Jensen. Thank you. Uh, Public Safety would like to present for a first reading ordinance 14 2019. <coughs> they move it up four years. <laughs> 2019, uh, amending chapter 70 180, the City of Stoughton Municipal Code, relating to no parking 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. by creating section 4. And again, this is a first reading. Be back in. We need to move it up? No. Okay. Be back in two weeks. Okay. Um, anybody want a description of this one? All the person, Hirsch? Yeah, it, is, it, it seems very odd. Why do we have just no parking from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m.? Those is two hours. That's a question. I think the chief has a real good answer That's, to that. Uh, it's similar to what the rest of the Main Street is. It allows for cleaning. This is the, the new city hall parking lot and allows for street sweeping and, and so forth and uh, road maintenance and plowing. Um, all of Main Street is. Can we do that from three to five a.m.? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, yes, four I people. live on Main Street. Yes, they do. <laughs> 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 no, I, I was just curious, but thank you. Welcome. Thank you for being here. <laughs> okay. So any other questions? If if something comes up in the next couple of weeks, <laughs> please reach out to us so we can hopefully have your answer <coughs> before it comes back. Um, and then the next one is Ordinance 15 of 2019, Alderperson Jensen. Oh, thank you again. Um, the Public Safety Committee presents for first reading Ordinance 15 2019, amending Chapter 70 176, Parent 78, City of Stoughton Municipal Code relating to parking restriction on Whole Avenue. And again, it's the first reading. Anything to add to this one, Chief? Uh, this came as a request from the Postal Service. They are going to do uh, community mailboxes in Nordic Ridge, so this restricts parking in front of those mailboxes. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, this one will be back in two weeks as well. <coughs> Alder Person Hiley. Yeah. Um, just wondering if someone could send out to the, the council a map of the this um, new development down near Nordic Ridge because. Um, Google Maps has not caught up. 
to the development and the, the street names and everything. I'll send it. Thank All right. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? Hearing none, and that will take us to Ordinance 16 of 2019 from uh, Public Safety. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Public Safety presents for first reading Ordinance 16, 2019, amending Chapter 70-176, Parent 79, City of Stoughton Municipal Code, relating to parking restrictions in Otteson Drive between Hole Avenue and Jens Court. And uh, that's first reading. And anything on this one, Chief? Same thing again for uh, community mailboxes, and that this covers a very shortened block area. Mm -hmm. I believe this is the area where the Parade of Homes is going to be this year. Correct. Yeah. And Which is from what uh, I just was out that way tonight, and actually saw that the mailbox, the community mailboxes, are actually put in now. So. Oh. Okay. All right. Any questions on this one? Otherwise, you'll see all three of these at the next council meeting. That'll take us to Ordinance 17. We're still on first readings. Exactly. Uh, this one also comes from Public Safety. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Public Safety presents uh, Ordinance 17 2019, amending Chapter 70 176, City of Stoughton Municipal Code, creating subsection parent 77 relating to parking restriction on the west side of Halts Road. And I would uh, remind you, first reading, this was. Uh, well, this was because of the Giannis thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this, there a lot, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of traffic out there, and it is creating issues for uh, the di different businesses out there. So they want to restrict the parking to one side, which would be to the, I believe it would be to the east side of the street, correct? Uh, I have to pull it up. I think uh, that's but this east. was a request from one of the businesses out yeah. there, and I personally yeah, talked to all the businesses affected, and they're perfectly fine with the no parking on one side to help with <clears throat> visibility and keeping traffic lanes open. So, yeah. Any questions on this one? All right, so we'll see this one with the rest of them. Um, item 17 is Ordinance 18 of 2019, and this one... Uh, is related to um, some action we took at a council meeting, so it's back to us for first reading. So this one hasn't really gone to a committee, um, so which is kind of unique. Usually something comes out of committee, but we decided, I think the council decided we wanted to bring this discussion back here. Is there anyone that would like to kick off this conversation? It's regards to the um, keeping of the honeybees, chicken regulations of animals. Uh, Alder person Hirsch. Sure. Um, there's a. I mean, uh, there's just a, a, a clarification in section two, um, subsection A, on what it said, except permitted in B, but it should be B, C, D, and E, because C. B deals with other mammals C and birds. C deals with the chickens and D is with the bees. And so it's all those that needs to be as permitted in those extra sections because those were added. Um, I guess I think other than that, it, it reads pretty well. Um, and I think it would... Just to clarify, I guess I would always say honeybees, is there now people are um, <coughs> setting up houses for native bees, mason bees, and I don't want people to be confused that this is specifically for honeybees. So you want us to change the language? Um, you say it up front as honeybees, but then maybe and. Maybe keeping of animals, birds, and hun and honeybees would be a little bit more explicit. Okay, keep it consistent. Yes. Yep. We can do that. Other than that, I don't have a problem with okay. it. Because it's in D also. Yep. In D also. Yeah. Okay. And are you thinking that this will come back to the council, or would you like it to go to a committee and then come back? Does it need to go to a committee? I don't think it has to. Didn't it start in public safety? It, well, it went to planning. It went to planning, yeah. 
this planning the one? original one started that planning and I think based in on feedback at the last meeting we wanted to do some work on it so we just brought it back here instead of sending it back to planning to make it a little bit more efficient but we can do whatever you desire no. go ahead the, the some of the if I remember correctly, some of the questions that were that were brought up were um, it had to do with not so much the keeping of these this husbandry but as to the registration the registration and and inspection mm -hmm. of uh, said premises and I think is and that the next one yeah so it there's is. two of them yeah well, so if I so my so if there's really not that much in in this section in, there's basically agreement as to the allowance of bees the allowance of chickens and the other mentions of the um, in, in B so I would move that this be um, not be go right to second reading with this so you want to waive the rules yes okay so there's a motion to waive the yes. rules and a second by Hirsch so waiving the rules takes a two-thirds vote and basically what we would be voting on is whether or not we can take action on this tonight versus what we traditionally do on ordinance is we bring it back at the next meeting does anybody have any questions about waiving the rules okay uh, all in favor of waiving the rules say aye. aye aye any opposed that carries so that takes us really well we didn't really have a motion now we can make a motion to do whatever you'd like with this we can approve it as is we can change the language that was recommended we could send it to committee but more than likely since you waived the rules I assume you want to vote on it tonight yes. I'll make a motion to approve with uh, the amendments that I had <coughs> the grammatical changes that I had suggested okay. second second by Harley and did you get all those changes yes and maybe what you can do is just run it past uh, all the person Hirsch when you get it to make sure we didn't miss anything. Could I just have that reread? Is it she's doing? Sure. So the, go ahead, Holly. The motion you want reread? Yeah, with the amendment. So the motion was to approve the ordinance um, with the corrections that it should always reference honeybees and not bees, and in section. Uh, section 2a 2a should in the first sentence it says no person shall keep any hoofed animals or bees should be honeybees within the, the city except as permitted in B C D and E because you have all these extra because we've added, we've added those extra parents yeah Did you follow that, Sid? Yeah. Okay. Did yeah. you catch all that? Yeah. So you have in section 6.2, keeping of animals, birds, and honeybees. And then in the section A, in that first sentence, you add C uh, after B, C, D, and E in parentheses. And then honeybees and D. And honeybees and D. Okay. Clear as mud? No, everybody got that right. Yep. Okay. Any questions on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Um, R72 of 2019, um, kind of the same deal uh, at the last council meeting. We talked about whether or not we should have registration and or inspection and fees so we basically put something in there um, in order to at least start the discussion and we can do what you want with it we figured this is a starting point doesn't necessarily have to be an ending point it's totally up to you does anybody want to start this all the person Hirsch um, I thought that we had said that this was going to be sent to CACP at the last <coughs> meeting and so I was kind of curious why that's what I have in my notes why it was brought here instead of trying to write a resolution 
during a city council meeting when it should have been sent to the committee per our what was decided back on the last meeting i honestly don't remember we can certainly send it there if that's what we said and that's what you want to do i remember that too yeah is that what we want to do i, I mean know, i mean i know that cacp is the appropriate committee but would it be CACP or planning? I mean, the reason it would be CACP is because it's going to go through the clerk's office for the registration and the fees. That's true. Yeah, that's true. And planning is more of the inspection. Right. So I'm not really sure. It's up to you guys. We're good either way. We'll get it done for you. What would you like to do? I think, it, it, I think as far as it's, a, it's going to a committee. It's going to CACP. That's yeah, fine. That's fine. Yeah. Is that okay? I mean, I just think it's it's better for a subcommittee to flesh out and discuss it instead of okay. right, all of us. All right, so we'll send it to CACP. Okay, Gene, seeing you're now, there's chair. Um, all the person, Borsma? I just have one question, and that is on the issue of, uh, it's, on, it's under, um, let's see, I think it's under B and regulations under B. Chicken coops that are less than 65 square feet in area are exempt from zoning permit and fee. Um, the, there are a number of places in town, developments and all that, that have uh, development agreements that do not allow extra coops or buildings or whatever. And whether or not this conflicts at all with with uh, developments in town that have those restrictions. And I, I, I'm just not quite sure. How are they restricted? Well, they, they say you can't have an extra building. You Who can't says? Have, the ordinance the, or the covenant? No, the... the 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 develop the people who developed them had these rules from the get go that this is how our property is supposed to be used, and if they say in their uh, in their HOA or whatever the the whatever the agreement is from developer, a developer sometimes have said you can't have extra buildings, and whether this conflicts with some places in town that that uh, have those kind of restrictions. Some, some, some HOAs say you can't have fences and some people say you can't have buildings. Sure. Whether or not this confuses us in terms of the city. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'll let Planning Director Shield or Laura, one of you two can weigh in on this one. You want to start, Rodney? Sure. I'm sure there are restrictive covenants in some neighborhoods that don't allow these. We don't enforce covenants. I think we've um, talked about this a little bit in the past. Restrictive covenants are above and beyond what local zoning regulations would have. So if there are um, th those type of restrictions, they may still be applicable to the properties, but outside of our, our control. And typically uh, privately enforced. Okay. So, nothing? Okay. So this will go to CACP. I guess the issue is, is for those that Those who want to do the registration for the chicken and the beekeeping, what do we do between now and when it comes back? Well, I think the chickens I, we've been we have something so right. Currently, our ordinances say that you don't have to have a chicken like chicken or bee license or permit, but you can have them. So I have I we only have a handful of them, but I have three or four on my desk right now that have filled out the paperwork, but. The ordinance says that we aren't registering them or giving them licenses so really it's just sitting on my desk and i'm not charging a fee currently because currently our ordinances say we don't um, so that's kind of why uh, the city attorney said let's just take it straight to council so we could get it figured out but those three or four people could wait a month and a half to or they could they could have them without it and we'd have to have them register it in a month or a month and a half right, right? And we could just communicate that to them because we don't want to stop them from mm -hmm. having them, no, right? We can't. We, we have an ordinance that says that they can have the, the bees and the chickens, but we just don't have a process for actually registering them. So this would be the registration form um, that we'd be able to keep track of who has the chickens and the bees. Holly, what, do they, what is at your desk? Um, well, currently I have a couple of our old chicken registration forms. And then there is one individual that um, I'm not sure if he currently has bees. Um, I know he was going to get them as soon as we passed the ordinance, so I, I'm not sure if he has them yet or not. Um, I have his contact information so I could get a hold of him and you know give him the registration form once we have it. But it's kind of 
in this weird limbo of what does our office do when people want these animals? So um, not speaking for the committee, but just the goal and the intent of this was safety and knowing where these things are. And so the fact that you know that these exist and people are offering, I encourage us to thank them and tell them that we apologize. We don't have a form ready at this time. Okay. And that we would ask for their compliance at when the forms are completed. But I, I guess I would just thank them for having their questions and, and that we'll get the registration form for officialness out as soon as possible. Does that work for everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess that's what we'll do. Otherwise, this will be going to CACP. We meet in, was it the first week of June? Mm -hmm. So if anybody sees anything in here between now and then, please feel free to let us know so we can address that before the meeting. So when we bring it back here, um, hopefully in June, uh, it'll be ready for prime time. Okay. Well, uh, we still have the one item on here. The moment we've all been waiting for. And, and Jamin's been waiting for. So we have a TIF 101 presentation on here. Unless you, you don't want to hear it. Yeah, I already heard it. <laughs> you already heard it? Um, so Jamin's going to cue this up. And basically what we're trying to do is, especially for those that um, are recent to the council, but even for us that have been around a while, to give us an update on um, some TIF jargon. So Jamin has taken the time to put this together for your enjoyment. <laughs> All right. Uh, it, and that's exactly what it is. It's TIF jargon. We'll kind of go through some of the basics of this. Um, if this at all looks familiar as we go through it, it's because you've probably seen it before if you've been on council for a while. If you actually Google TIF 101, Matt Dragney actually pops up as one of the, <laughs> one of the top ones. Um, but all the information is very similar. I just tried to, to make it flow and pull in some of the basic information for you folks. Um, again, we're just, we're just trying to get to the high level and make sure you're familiar with the process, acronyms, terminology, things like that. Um, in terms of this presentation, I didn't go into anything like economic analysis, return on investment, um, metric measuring, anything like that. If you'd like me to come back at a later date, because this is so exciting for you, I can certainly do that. But for now, we, we kept it to the basics. So again, a few things we're going to go over tonight. Um, we'll talk about tax incremental financing, history and basics. Again, it's just history of the TIF, the, the terminology, things like that. Uh, we'll talk about what uh, TIF is and what it isn't. We'll go into tax allocation clarification a little bit in terms of how all the different taxing jurisdictions are treated throughout the entire process. Uh, we'll talk about the types of TIDs and the eligible projects within the TID boundaries. Um, we'll go through the TID creation process and how the Joint Review, Joint Review Board or JRB falls into that process. And we'll talk about some best practices and risk management and then I'll give you a brief summary of the active TIDs in Stoughton. Um, as of pretty much 1231.18 are the numbers that we have. So again, a couple acronyms for you. TIF, Tax Incremental Financing, TID, Tax Increment District. You will find as we work through different TIF information uh, throughout the coming years, um, we'll use these interchangeably, and I'm sure you will as well. Uh, so if you hear TIF, TID, we're basically talking about the same thing. Uh, they've been around for quite some time. They were first authorized in 1974. 1975 um, and, and obviously with any major leg legislation the TIF law has been amended many times over the years. Uh, so just walking through some important TIF definitions, base value, um, this is the equalized value of the real um, and I'll kind of cross out personal property at this point because um, personal property doesn't really exist from a taxing standpoint anymore. Uh, but it's the equalized value of the real property in a TID when the TID is actually created. So if we started a TID right now based on just this room, the base value would be how much this room is actually valued at. And that's the base value forever for the life of that TID. Okay, the base value does not change. Uh, property value increment, that's the difference between the base value and the current value. So you have your base value and then as, the, as we do projects within the TIF boundaries, that equalized value increases based on the assessed value pretty much. Um, and, and the increment value is the change between the base and then what the actual current value is. And then the tax increment is actually the taxes levied on that change. So you have your base levy tax, which is the, the base value, and you have a tax on that, and then you have a separate tax, which is called the tax increment, which is the tax on the actual uh, change in value. Uh, 
And if you have any questions along the way, you know, shout them out. Okay, so just some additional history and basics. Obviously, the city will create a TIF district. You never lose control of that. Um, you'll hear this a couple times throughout the presentation. It's the but for clause uh, in terms of creating a TIF. So finding must be made that expected development would not occur but for TIF. Um, the overall intent of this is actually to make sure it, it, it actually it, the intent is to prevent gifts to private uh, enterprise. So we're, we're it's basically saying this this development within this TIF district would never occur unless there was some sort of TIF incentive involved. Um, the boundary is established within which costs are incurred and the new tax base is created. Uh, the tax base within the boundary does not change those boundary the, the boundary does not change you can actually expend within a half mile of the actual boundary itself though um, the next three points in terms of tax allocation um, the base value and how all of that works we'll get into in, in, in a little bit more depth in a couple of slides um, and then the, the bottom point there tax revenue on new development is used to pay the expenses for preparing the area for development so it's basically taking an area that otherwise won't be developed using the increment to actually make improvements to, to, to attract development within that area. Um, so what is TIF? Uh, since 1976, it's been the most powerful economic development tool <laughs> available to local government. Um, it, it's actually really the only meaningful tool available to municipalities to, to take areas that otherwise would not be developed um, and bring some private investment into the area. Um, again, you want to address the community development objectives, whether it's industrial development, mixed use development, eliminate some blighted areas or rehab deteriorating areas. Uh, Stoughton actually has three of these areas. We do have industrial TIDs, we have mixed use TIDs, and we have blight TIDs right now. And it can't be used for any residential development, right? It can, that, and that's part of the mixed use development. Yep. So get into that more specific, mm -hmm. there's a slide for that. Is there? I don't yeah, the 35% right. rule. Um, so what, it, what is TIF? Uh, it, it ultimately, it's a public-private partnership. Uh, it's also a partnership between the taxing entities. In our case, it would be the city, county, school district, and then MATC. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it's a public. It, it, it incentivizes public and private sectors to work together to stimulate economic growth that otherwise would not occur. So what TIF is not? Um, TIF is not a tax exemption. It's not a tax rate increase. It's not a tax rate differential. And it's not an entitlement or a giveaway. Um, it, there's a lot of common misconceptions about what TIF actually is. Uh, sometimes you'll hear corporate welfare or subsidy. It's actually not that. The same taxes are being paid. The same rate is being paid. What it is, it's just an incentive to come in and develop an area that otherwise would not be developed. So. Um, again, it, it's not a tax exemption or a subsidy in any way, shape, or form. So why was TIF created? So apparently back in 1976, uh, some federal funding decreased for community development programs, um, and, and it allowed cities and villages to work with the private sector to stimulate ec economic growth. Prior to TIF, basically the city was having to shoulder all of the costs for the economic uh, development of areas that would not be developed. So all of the taxing jurisdictions were getting their share, but the city was having to invest all the dollars in terms of economic development and redevelopment and things like that. So the actual legal definition or legal purpose of TIF is to promote the orderly development of the city. Uh, here's a, a quick summary of the districts in Wisconsin. I believe this is as of April 30th of this year. So right now we have 1,320 active TIDs within Wisconsin. Uh, you can see the majority of them are actually mixed-use districts, blight elimination districts, and then industrial. The mixed use is where the residential would come into play, and that's actually leading the charge in terms of active TIDs within Wisconsin right now. Um, you've maybe seen a slide similar to this, but this is basically the tax allocation and how all of this works. And I know it, it's probably a little confusing when you first look at it, but if you, if you take the far left vertical line there, consider that basically the base year, the creation year. So we're creating a TID on that particular date. The bottom blue section represents the base value at that point in time. Taxes collected throughout the life of the TIF on that base value, which will never change throughout the life of the TID, 
uh, taxes collected on that base value will still be shared between the city, uh, county, local school district, and then the MATC. The yellow represents the increase or the, the property value increment as it increases throughout the life of the TID in terms of investment going into that into the, the TIF district, the equalized value going up, along with that the assessed value goes up and you're collecting the actual extra tax throughout the life of that project to, to fund additional projects within that TIF district. Um, and then the far right vertical line would obviously be the termination year. Um, and then at the at, at the closeout of the TIF, then we start sharing amongst the four different taxing jurisdictions again at the close of it. So, any questions? Yes. I raised an issue last time when we met at council, and that was um, whether or not, when you have a development going on, whether you can whether a developer can go back and say, we want to have a TID, we want to have TIF money for this development. And I would be interested in knowing the legal aspects of that because if it's a if it's a but for and the development has already started, whether or not um, a developer can then ask for TIF money after the fact. And I, I think Laura would might be able to address that, um, our city attorney, uh, because it seems to me that that would fly in the face of a but for because if the development has already started and they go back for TIF money, that seems like it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense because the development is already gone. So we're, we're potentially facing that in the future and I, I guess I'd like an opinion about that. I, I think you can amend. Um. Well, you can amend if there's a TIF already in place, but. What about if there's no TIF in place, the developer starts a project, like we're talking about doing that, and then the developer comes back and says, we want TIF money for this particular development that's already going forward. That doesn't make sense with the but-for provision of the TIF. Well, I think they would define the scope of the TIF project mm -hmm. from that point in time forward. So they would just have a different, would have a different definition of the project and the project costs that they would be asking you to, to look at. But I think they can come in. So let's say they, they start the project and there's uh, no city financing and then they get halfway and they say, actually, we'd like the city to put in some sidewalks or street lamps or some sort of public infrastructure. And they can come, I think they can. I don't think there's anything that prevents them from proposing uh, creating a project and going through the, the process. And the project itself that we're talking about right now, it, and Rodney can correct me if I'm wrong on this because I don't have all the history on it, but the, the f I think the, all the individual phases of this project were in the original project plan, correct? Yeah, the, remember this is a larger, Kettle Park West is what's being referred to, I, I believe. Kettle Park West area has a larger TIF district. So the TIF district boundaries are greater than what's been developed to date. That's my understanding. The TIF request that was honored encompassed the commercial center that's been constructed to date. Future requests would be for improvements above and beyond what's already been done in that area. And, and as I said the last council meeting, I had heard that there was some rumbling in this legislature about the fact that TIF money cannot be added to a project that doesn't start off with TIF money. <coughs> I and I, ha I haven't seen anything from any of the league and municipalities or cities and villages of any legislation. And in fact, anything that was in the budget that referred to TIF, I just looked at it yesterday. I didn't see that provision. Okay. And anything that was in there, the joint finance pulled out anyway. So I don't anticipate any changes in, in the TIF laws, at least for this budget cycle, unless something changes. Yeah. I just want to make sure that, that our week. city council is sure about that. Yeah, I'll be at the Capitol next week. I can certainly check into that. Okay. Well, and, and if we do move forward, this Laura's firm would be with us every step of the way, and they'd make us aware of this. But in terms of the but for test, it's it's been it's been asked and answered, um, and that's just at the actual creation of the TIF itself. Okay, so this slide, I, I won't go through in too much detail, but I just wanted to kind of show you how 
the taxes get allocated. So if you go down a couple lines on the far left, you can see the city of Stoughton. Uh, the first column there is the 2018 levy approved, which is the $9,032,000. That's what actually went into our budget that you saw that, that taxpayers outside of the tax incremental district were actually paying. And then if you go to the second column from the right, you see the $425,000 that's the additional taxes coming out of the tax incremental district. So um, it, it doesn't come out of the general fund tax levy. It's, it's its whole separate levy that just goes directly into the TIF district. Yeah. Um, so TIF funding does affect our debt burden though, correct? If we take out debt, yes. If, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And we just updated the policy, right? Yes. And the policy is our preferred method is pay go, which the developer would finance. Okay, so this is just kind of the beginning stages of a TIF. Actually, I guess this, this graphic is before a TIF is actually created, and you can see underutilized property, property taxes of $2,500 per year are getting spread out amongst the four different um, taxing jurisdictions at this point. So at that point, the city decides to go ahead and go through and create a TIF. It goes through the process, gets passed through the Joint Review Board. Um, and, and throughout the life of this TID, then you can still see that $2,500 a year. And again, this is assuming everything, nothing changes at this point. So $2,500 a year throughout the life of this, this TIF, that's basically the base tax on the base value of the property. That's going to the four different taxing jurisdictions. And then as the value of this property increases, the tax increment revenue would go into the actual TIF fund itself to continue to fund additional improvements and incentivize development within that area. And then as we close this out, in this instance, property taxes are at 302000 a year now, and that begins to get spread out amongst the four different taxing jurisdictions. So any questions on how that kind of works high level? So basically, somebody takes out a loan to do the improvements, and the increased revenue from the value of the property, the increased value through the property taxes, pays that loan back, and then whatever is left over gets split up amongst the different taxing jurisdictions. Yeah, that's if we choose to give a developer any money. Um, what it also does, if we if, if we weren't to give the developer any money, if they were going to finance everything on their end, we may be involved on the, the public improvement side of things, something like that, putting streets in, stormwater infrastructure, things like that. Um, so some of the benefits throughout the life of the TIF. Um, public improvements can be made during the early phases of the TIF projects. Um, again, incentivizing and, and making development attractive within that TIF district. Uh, public improvements can also be made using excess funds towards the end of the expenditure period of the TIF. Um, there is a cash windfall allocated to indivi indiv the individual taxing jur jurisdictions upon TIF termination. Uh, and then we do get a slight increase to the actual base tax levy upon TIF termination as well. And I think we have some examples of where that might come in play, right? Uh, which uh, one? The uh, second bullet point. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this would be actually TIF 4 right now, which is downtown. Our expenditure period is about to run up, I believe. We have to have our expenditure period ends, I think, March 21. So we're looking at some improvements in downtown. Uh, in 2020, it's a fair amount of money that the TIF has built up, so we can start looking at uh, crosswalk work, sidewalk work, things like that. So. Um, going through a couple of the, the different, the major types of TIDs we'll go through, we'll go through the three. Uh, you have the industri industrial development TID. Um, these were actually part of the original legislation back in 1975, 76. Um, so 50% of the area needs to be suitable for and zoned for industrial development. You have an expenditure period of 15 years, uh, a max life of 20, and then you do have a, a three-year extension option if you choose to go that route. Uh, and this would be within Stoughton, our TIFs 3 and 6, which is the Business Park North and then the Business Park North expansion. And probably one which is closed, right? Yes. That yeah. was when we originally built Stoughton Trailers. Uh, then you have the mixed use TID. Um, this was actually created in 2004 through some of the changes to the laws. Uh, you must have at least two land uses, whether it's commercial, residential, residential, industrial, or a mix of the three. Uh, no more than 35% can be newly platted residential, though. Um, and TID expenditures may be, may be 
made for the residential if one of the following applies density at least three units uh, conservation subdivision or a traditional neighborhood development uh, and then it has the same type of expenditure period as the industrial um, and this would be the kpw the tiff seven is the 35 percent area or is it value um that i am not sure off the top of my head we need to know that mm. it's area okay it's area but we can confirm. That's why we need Matt here. Um, and then you have blight elimination, TID. Uh, typically, older neighborhoods, 50% of area must be declared blighted. Uh, it does require a formal designation of blight, um, and letters must be sent to the landowners. And we do have a, a little bit longer life to these types of TIDs, so an expenditure of 22 years versus 15 and a max life of 27. Um, and this would be our TIFFs 5 and 8 right now. And then you have environmental remediation. Um, we, Stoughton does not have any of these right now, but you can see the eligible costs are remediation, property acquisition, demolition, asbestos removal, uh, basically anything related to envir environmental remediation. Um, so going through the eligible TIF projects, um, you can see they, be, they can be located within the TID or within a one-half mile radius of the TID boundary itself. Um, eligible projects must benefit the TID um, or add value to the TID. Uh, and you can see eligible projects really include, include pretty much everything uh, from infrastructure to debt service costs to actually administering the TIF itself. Uh, if you think about some of the public benefits in, involved in the eligible project costs, that would be streets, stormwater, um, water, wastewater infrastructure, electric infrastructure, um, and then some of the, the actual private pro project costs would include if a grocery store goes up, if a Walgreens goes in, anything like that. Um, and then you do have an option to extend uh, a TIF for one year uh, for affordable housing purposes. And that's what this slide is addressing. So we do have the option to include or to extend TIFFs for, for an additional year. Um, it is a city council resolution. It does not have to pass through the joint review board. Um, out of common courtesy, we would probably take it to the JRB first just to make sure that any of the taxing jurisdictions weren't counting on any of the potential windfall or increase to the tax base. Um, 75% of that additional year's worth of increment must be used for affordable housing. Okay. Uh, and then we have the, the, the housing definition there. Uh, you have a number of options here if you do choose to go this route. We are entertaining this idea for TIF 3, which is closing in 2020. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to go towards one big affordable housing project. You can set up revolving loan type programs to fund um, updates to some of the, the dilapidated buildings throughout town. Um, you can set up um, first down payment programs for some some would-be homeowners that just don't have the down payment so there are a number of options that we can use this money for as well Jamie can you tell me where TIF 3 is TIF 3 is the business park north so tip creation process typically takes plus or minus 90 days uh, governing body being the city council would actually authorize the TID creation process then it would go through the, the appropriate channels, whether it's plan commission or RDA for the blight. Um, and then the JRB has an organizational meeting. <coughs> City Council finalizes the resolution, and then the Joint Review Board adopts the resolution. Yes? Jamie, okay, just one question, and that is, can one of those entities stop the TIF then? Yes. So the City Council, the only body that can actually say, yes, we want to create a TIF district would be the council itself, and then it would have to go through the Joint Review Board. They would have the option of actually voting it down and not adopting that resolution. The majority at the JRB. Yeah, yep. yeah, so it, it, it could not just be one party. It would have to be majority. Typically, the member at large traditionally has been the, the chamber uh, director, so it would be Laura Trotter. Um, would, would be the at-large member and then the rest of the entities can designate somebody mm -hmm. so the school district it could be the superintendent or or his designee and the same thing with the county or MATC it's whoever they want to send but they typically have been fairly consistent on who they send 
Yeah. I've, I think the whole school board the last time voted on this. Well, they made a recommendation to the superintendent who ultimately okay. was on the JRB. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't been to many joint review board meetings, but they're generally on board for whatever the city thinks is the best the best move, step forward. So, um, typically for the taxing entities, they really have nothing to lose and everything to gain because the value is going to go up, and ultimately it's going to create more revenue for them. Um, so TID required findings, again, we kind of touched on the but for test. Um, there is a 12% rule where the equalized value of the TID plus the increment in existing TIDs cannot exceed 12%. Um, Stoughton is currently at 4.5% as of 12-31-18. Um, I ran the numbers real quick. Um, we would have to put an additional $87 million worth of increment. Uh, to reach the 12 percent as of where we're at right now and, and you know, of course our equalized value is going to continue to increase so that number will increase as well so we we have a little bit of room uh, district must be contiguous um, and contains only whole units of parcels uh, plan improvements will enhance the value of the property within the TID and it has to s directly serve the purpose of the TID uh, and then improvements to the district are likely to encourage and promote conformity with the city's plans and policies. So at, at the end of the day, the city really never loses control of what is actually happening within the TIF. Uh, generally, you can get a lot of control with, through the development agreement process. Um, some best practices. So again, you need to look at the public benefit versus the private windfall. Um, you need to look at the appropriate payback period. Um, broader imp fiscal impact in terms of housing. Is there a housing need? Do we see declining enrollment in schools? Things like that. Um, you also want to look at the other impacts in terms of traffic, jobs, public services. How many more services do we need to, to offer as a city uh, if there is growth within a TIF district? Um, obviously, you want to be able to control some of the quality of the development and be involved in that process. Um, and then, then maintain consistency with the other plans that the city has in place. Um, so managing cash flow, obviously you want to match up the expenses to the revenue. Um, if you're incurring a, a lot of expenses on the front end of a TIF, you may be forced to actually borrow for it. But if you can match up your expenses to actually incur the expenses as the increment grows, you can just fund them as you go through the process. Um, you do want to build in a cash flow cushion as you're doing some of these projections. Um, obviously prepare an annual TIF financial analysis, which we're doing right now. Um, we do go through an annual review with the governing board. Um, the, the auditors actually come and, and present every year at finance, and there'll be a council um, in a couple of weeks to present the, the financial statements as well. Uh, you do have the option to share revenue between TIF districts. This was called a donor district, so if one TIF is, is, is outperforming the expectations and another TIF is struggling, there is an option to, to set up a donor district, and I believe it's five years um, that you can set that up for that another TID can donate to a, to a struggling TID. Um, and then obviously we want to use all available consulting resources. So some risk management, obviously timing and phasing of expenditures rel relative to the expected increment. Again, you don't want to outpace the, 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 the revenue that's coming in with your expenditures. Uh, and then you want to focus on the development agreements that are in place. Um, so some of the methods to reduce the risk, uh, obviously be conservative, build in a cushion. Uh, you have the first mortgage on property. Uh, developer guarantee of, of tax increment, which we have in place in a number of our TIF districts right now. Um, you can do a performance bond or letter of credit, which I believe we had in place throughout the, the KPW phase one. Um, you could always do full blown developer financed or the pay as you go option. Yes. So the guarantee of tax increment saying that if uh, property values don't go up as much as they thought the developer covers that gap? Yep, they're, they're not necessarily the developer in, in the KPW um, instance. We have an agreement, a, kind of a weird three-party agreement with the developer in Walmart, but Walmart is actually guaranteed it. We actually sent them a bill, I think, for $33,000 um, at the end of the year. It's due in two installments. They actually paid their first installment. We thought we'd have a fight on our hands, but we didn't. They generally adhere to what these agreements are saying. Uh, we have one in place with NAFA. They're guaranteeing a, a fair amount of value in the in the TIF six district. So uh, it, it's just another way to to protect yourselves. 
Um, here's our TID summary, so you can see when the, the date they were created and when they're closing. Uh, again, in, in industrial TIF is TIF 3 and 6. Our blighted areas are TIF 4, 5, and 8, and then our mixed use is TIF 7, which is KPW. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but the top one is basically the, the uh, history of our existing TIFs right now, and you can see the, the blue section there on, on the top graph is the base value, and then the orange represents the increment value that's been added um, to, to that base value. So you can see we, we've had some success with our TIF districts. The bottom, bottom chart is actually the same exact chart. It's just broken out by the individual TIF districts. Um, this is our current mixed use TIF district. This is uh, TIF 7 or KPW. The top chart there, uh, the, the bottom blue line was the base value of that property out there, and the orange line represents the increase in increment uh, since we created that TIF district. Um, here's a summary of our industrial TIDs. You can see the top chart is the exact same thing. Blue, which you can barely see, was the base value when we created these TIDs. The orange is the incremental value that's been added to those TIDs since they were created. So I think the blue was... <coughs> 30,000. It was really, really small amounts, so that's why you can barely see it. So all of the value within TIF 3 and TIF 6 right now is all incremental value at this point. Um, and then here's a summary of our blighted TIDs right now. You can see the blue is the base value, uh, and then the orange is the incremental value right now. Uh, and then here's some useful links. The, the DOR TIF manual is actually, it's a pretty easy read. Um, it's a good good reference if you do have questions. It's in PDF if you use this. Uh, you can just search keyword and pull things up. I used it quite a bit while I was preparing this. Obviously, you have the Wisconsin Department of Revenue TIF homepage. Um, it's pretty easy to, to navigate around. They do have some interactive tools that are actually pretty nice as well. Um, and then the City of Stoughton TIF audit reports give a kind of a high-level summary of, of how the TIFs are doing financially and some footnotes that support um, some of the information within it. Any questions? Yeah. All right, who wants to take the test? It's a lot of information. Um, if anybody has any questions now or later, don't be afraid to send them our way. We'd like to be able to answer them. It looks like we have a couple things to follow up on, so we'll, we'll do that. Um, As I had said in the Finance Committee earlier, looking through this, this presentation, I found it to be really helpful in dispelling a lot of information that could be a little muddy in order to figure it out and that we should certainly promote this to as many of our constituents as we can and i would add in the finance packet there was also a summary of our our, our tiff districts right. that we currently have in place so if you can't remember which one is three and which one is eight there's a nice summary in the finance packet that you can refer to that really breaks it down and easy to read. Um, Alder Person Jensen. I'll move to adjourn if nobody else has any questions. All right, Second. there's a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second by Eileen. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed, thank you.